the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. 2021 was proof that change is not necessarily permanent, that it requires constant commitment. In this episode of Challenge 2.0, we'll talk with representatives of two different organizations who are committed to providing voices and influence to those possessing neither. They'll share lessons they've learned on how to advocate for change that matters to you. So we're very fortunate today to have three people who are in the forefront of empowering people uh, to have more of an opportunity to participate in advocacy for the various programs and efforts and things that are important to them in their lives. I'd like to introduce Elise DeGoyer, who is the Executive Director of the Faith Action Network, uh, Kristen Ang, who is the Policy Engagement Director for FAN, and Terry Kylo, who is the Executive Director of Paths to Understanding, and you have seen Terry on this program any number of times. Uh, Kristen, Elise, and Terry, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be here. Well, to begin, uh, and although Elise, I know, has been on the program also in the past, we might begin with just a little thumbnail, if you will, description of what Faith Action Network uh, is and does, and also paths to understanding. And so, Elise, we might begin with you on that. Well, great. It's wonderful to be with you again and to be able to tell the audience that Faith Action Network is our statewide interfaith advocacy and social justice organization in Washington. We um, have been around for 10 years. We just celebrated our 10th birthday in 2021. And so we're looking to this year and the future 10 years with a hope of being, um, creating even more opportunities for people as citizens, as um, residents of the state of Washington to lift their voices together for social justice and for environmental justice across our state. Terry, tell us a little bit, we have done entire programs on past understanding, but uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the mission of past understanding. The mission of past to understanding is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. And a lot of what we try to do is to just help start multi-faith partnerships and relationships across the state. And like in programs like this, tell the positive story of how people of different traditions respect and know each other, like each other, and work together for the common good. And that's why we're so excited about our partnership with FAN, because we're always out there talking to people about how they can come together in local communities and join a, the broader interfaith community with FAN and help make a difference in the world. Now, we're going to get into more detail on some of the efforts, uh, some of the issues that Elise and Kristen are working on, and Terry, get your input on that as well. But looking at the big picture, I think people see so much infighting going on, especially in Washington, D.C., in Congress, uh, that more than a few people say, and I've heard it in conversations that I've had with them, is what is the use of even trying to exert some influence? It seems like they're entirely taken up in their own loggerheads. Uh, Elise, I'd begin with you. Uh, what is your response when you hear that or if you were to hear that? Well, you do hear it. Obviously, we feel um, the divide in our country. And the only way we're going to get past that is by building the relationships Terry talked about, is by getting to know each other across the idea of other or across um, different ideologies. Mm -hmm. You know, we just celebrated Dr. King's birthday, and um, he spoke a lot about silence. He had a lot to say about silence, and silence will not get us out of this sitting in our own camps won't get us out of this. We really need to build understanding across divides. So I feel very committed to that. Fan feels very committed to that. And it's fun too. I mean, it's really good to understand the humanity, um, where people are coming from to move, move past those divisions. Kristen, as part of your title, engagement uh, policy engagement director, uh, that speaks directly to trying to uh, develop relationships. What's your take on that? 
Well, connections and relationships are key. And a lot of times I would say the media tries to focus it, focus on the divide rather than what unites us. If you ask your neighbor and most people, they want good schools, they want housing, they want healthcare. That actually, if you ask people what they would like to see, the community that they would envision, they would, you know, they would come up with the same thing. And it is about connecting with those that maybe are either Republican, Democrat, or independent, or any other type of political stripes, but they are looking at similar visions. And I think with Faith Action Network, for me, it's about triple E, it's education, engagement, and empowerment. It is not just me in Olympia. It is the, this, you know, over 160 faith communities and then some. Okay. All these interfaith voices uh, united are stronger and can advocate for this vision that we have for our community. Terry, you don't necessarily have the same point of access uh, in engaging with people in the legislature, but I want to get your perspective on this as well. So when the Declaration of Independence was, was first written, it started with we the people. Uh, which means that we have to understand that each the pe person across the street, the person across the table, the person with a different perspective is a person. So we the people have a responsibility here. And that responsibility may be easy. And we may be feeling incredible despair about a lot of things in our world right now. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we have a responsibility with each other to, uh, to, to, to engage in democratic action, to think through policy, and we have, I think with the neighbors in my neighborhood, we have much more in common than we have difference. Mm -hmm. When we can sit down, maybe across the hedge and talk about some of those things and find that, you know, we the people actually can recognize each other as human beings and fulfill our difficult sometimes, but mm -hmm. still responsibility to participate in democracy. As we read the news coverage, and I think that was an excellent point when you were talking about uh, that very often there's a focus on conflict uh, between different parties or different legislators or Congress people. But uh, when we look at the coverage or uh, actual live broadcast from Congress, you get a sense of real dysfunction. Is there a greater level of interaction and attempts to seek common ground in Olympia compared to Washington, DC? I would say this Washington is a lot better off than the other Washington uh, when it comes to relationships between the parties. On uh, Martin Luther King Day, I heard uh, Representative Chambers, a Republican, talk about um, you know, her vision with Martin Luther King about um, equality. Mm -hmm. And then you had Representative uh, Jamila Taylor talk about equity and that they're, that they are actually, they have a lot of in common with the Republicans. They both want equality. You said mm -hmm. the Democrats are focused on, focusing on equity to get to that equality. So I think the, the language choices and how they wish to address each other is a lot different uh, in DC than here in Washington state. It's a lot more respectful and civil here. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't changed since we've gone to essentially online uh, legislative sessions and hearings and that sort of thing? I think online has increased participation and I'm backed up by the facts. There has been double the amount of comments and participation uh, by the people. Um, most people in Eastern Washington, as well as those uh, representing uh, dis disability rights activists, uh, they are saying that they would like to keep uh, online participation. Interesting. Because you don't have to travel. Uh, you have to travel from your home or any place else. Uh, you can be anywhere and participate in the process. So it's been an equalizer. Perhaps the lobbyists are disliking this process, <laughs> but the people are loving it. How much of a learning curve was there to get from that initial point of, no, we can't meet together to where we're at now in terms of access? And Elise and uh, Kristen, I'd ask both of you to respond to that. Yeah, I think there was definitely a, a shift and we use the word pivot there a lot um, during those months. Um, and just a turnaround to, you mean I can't go meet with my legislator? Mm -hmm. How will I get my message across? And I really applaud the state of Washington for figuring out some systems um, pretty quickly for us to be able to continue to be active citizens um, in our democracy. Um, it's still kind of uh, 
a pivot for us as Faith Action Network because we really like to be in person, right? We're faith communities. Right. Faith communities like to be in person. Um, and each community is, is figuring that out for themselves. What's safe? What is it? Um, but as far as advocacy, uh, I think meeting your legislator across the screen is still kind of a, huh, did, did they hear me? But when I see those uh, meetings take place, mm -hmm. I feel like they might even hear more because they're not distracted as much. They're there for that 15 minutes or whatever they've allotted. So I applaud the state of Washington for setting up some systems. We are learning to teach people about those systems. Um, Kristen told me about a hearing that uh, she testified at just this morning that there were 2,000 people signed in in favor wow. of the bill. 2,000 people would never have been in Olympia. 2,000 people might not have remembered to, to dial the legislative hotline, which is still an effective tool. Mm -hmm. um, so it's exciting. That's very exciting. We do, we do look forward to the two-way conversation in person again someday. <clears throat> but in the meantime, we'll use the, the tools we have. So there potentially is the intimidation factor, uh, not necessarily based in any fact, but somebody uh, is at a point, they feel strongly on an issue, they want to influence their legislator or at least have a conversation on them, and they may feel a little bit intimidated. What would you say to them? I always tell people that you never have to be perfect. In fact, no one is perfect, not even your legislator is a human being and that they don't legislate in a vacuum that they want to hear from you because you have the information and lived experience that they are seeking that they are missing and they would like input to make the best legislation possible and the the best thing for you to do is simply uh, state what you have to say and it's and it's definitely good enough uh, so I don't do a set of parameters that you have to know every single thing. You have to know the entire process to participate. No, just click and send in a comment or sign in pro or con comment to your legislator, uh, call the hotline, uh, make your viewpoints and perspectives known. And that you have done a lot already. Um, I would say with this uh, online, people adapted very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, it also revealed a digital divide, which we are now trying to fix mm. in the legislature. So those who likely weren't on, um, didn't have the digital devices or could get on Wi-Fi, they probably weren't making their voices heard in other places as well. But here now that we have seen this divide, we are advocating for everyone to, to have access. Mm -hmm. As well as one of the things that I've seen that was unique was for House Bill 1756, which is restricting solitary confinement, which a lot of multi-faith coalitions are very much against solitary confinement because it is a form of torture. Mm -hmm. I saw people who are currently incarcerated, who have experienced solitary confinement, be able to testify. Really? It was much easier for them. So, so this has allowed people, people who have been impacted by legislation to to have access to their legislatures and to give testimony so that we can all hear. Now, you have, as part of Faith Action Network, uh, developed some different programs, and you've also highlighted some programs that even exist within the state legislature for giving people a better sense of how to access and how to influence uh, policymakers. Uh, could you just give us some examples of those and talk about how those work? Yeah, I'll begin there just to say each year we adopt a legislative agenda. Now it grows, it changes, it morphs during the legislative session. But so we always develop that with our community's input in mind and our coalitions and staff board program committees. And then once we have established that, we offer um, ways to learn more about each of those items. So we, on our website, we have fact sheets about the issues um, that have been adopted. We have a bill tracker that each week is updated to show how that bill is moving through the legislature. Um, we offer advocacy days, um, one in Spokane this year, one focused on Olympia. Um, and we had some pre-session trainings that we co-sponsored with Paths to Understanding to help people get ready. And everybody always wishes for more preparation. You know, there is a desire to be perfect. Um, and Kristen's so good about reminding us, we, we don't, just speak our truth. 
and mm -hmm. um, speak what we know. And so, so we did two pre-session trainings and we're able to share some of the wonderful videos that were created by Paths to Understanding to help people get um, a sense of why even bother, like mm -hmm. the questions you're asking, Jeff, why bother advocating? Will it matter? We hear that every year. And, you know, it takes some time to really talk through that with people and hear their concerns or fears and then how to advocate. Let's say somebody has heard now that you have these advocacy days. How do they become aware of those? How do they register for those? All on our website, uh, fanwa.org. We have um, registration links. Once people register, we are able to set up appointments with their electeds um, so they can meet that day. But it's not just one day, right? So it's establishing a relationship both with your legislators and with the people in your legislative district, mm -hmm. people you might not have known before. After those days, we also um, send out a weekly e-news, which usually has action steps that are timely for the week mm -hmm. that people can take action on one or five different bills on our very long and growing agenda. Terry, what moved you as executive director of Past Understanding to say we need to partner and we need to develop an education process or program for people to understand how you can effectively advocate for an issue? Well, the first thing, Jeff, is, you know, after putting uh, over 100,000 miles on my car in the last five or six years, driving around the state, uh, giving speeches, I realized that we have to have some more online courses for people because we just can't get out everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the people want to access information. They want to do some thinking and preparation on their own time and their own schedule. And so that's why we developed the Paths Network as a, a way for people to be able to access that. And then of course, thinking about the need for people of faith all across the state, people of different wisdom traditions to come together. Well, sometimes people want to do a little thinking and preparation before they really feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And this is a great way for people to do that. And there's really two parts to it. As Elise said, there's thinking about your why. Why is it important, you know, objectively, like as part of the democratic process, but also getting more clear about why it's important to you. Mm -hmm. Because the most powerful thing a person has in a conversation is their own why, their own reason, their own deep values. And then second, it's really important to be effective with that and not be perfect. I really appreciate what Kristen and Elise have said about that, but also to think through some strategies and what is most effective so we can use our time well and make the kind of difference our shared values are, are asking of us. Mm -hmm. So the, the website is called uh, www.pathsnetwork.org. And once you get there, you can sign up for one of these courses and you kind of get to a homepage after you kind of register a little bit and you'll see some discussions going on. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to share why you joined the Paths Network. And then down on the left, you go to the go to the to the courses menu and there you'll see a number of courses, including how to advocate and why to advocate. Mm -hmm. And you can sign up for those courses. And what you'll see there are videos from people of faith, uh, from leaders uh, in the legislature and also from Elise and members of FAN, as well as the, the person on the, on the PAS network uh, that in part of the PAS to Understanding that put together the program, Ian Olson, mm -hmm. uh, to help you clarify your why and to help you understand how to do this work. Uh, Elise and Kristen, what are some of the key issues that you're really looking to advocate for in this legislative session right now? I would say that we are always looking uh, at economic justice. Uh, inc that means uh, expanding free lunches to students, increasing cash grants to those are aged, uh, dis blind and disabled, uh, making sure that the uh, Paid Family Act is equitable and compassionate to our working families, uh, increasing health care coverage, like the charity care, charity care to 2.2 million Americans or Washingtonians specifically, that would really change their lives. Mm -hmm. We also look at criminal justice reform. I, I mentioned before about solitary confinement. We'd like that to end, 
but if not, at least make it humane. And that's House Bill 1756 to transform people's lives. We'd also want to work on reentry issues, which is prohibiting discriminations against the prohibiting landlord discrimination against those who have been previously incarcerated, as well as ensuring that everyone has a home. So we do ask uh, that the housing trust fund uh, be increased. Mm -hmm. And as um, people of faith and conscience, we believe that we are environmental stewards. So we are advocating for the Renew Act that would improve and modernize our recycling system and reduce plastics and waste in our environment. Mm -hmm. As you look back at the prior legislative session, uh, what are a couple of examples of what you consider your major successes and uh, were there a couple of disappointments that you're now rolling into the package that you are working on this legislative session? Yeah, I would say um, one that the 2021 legislative session was um, touted as one of the most progressive and successful um, legislative sessions in 40 years. Mm -hmm. So that says a lot. Um, and there were just a lot of things people have worked on for 10 years or more. Um, the capital gains tax was a huge mm -hmm. win uh, in the legislative session. Of course, it's being challenged in court, but it was a step and it's a step towards a large coalition um, across our state who wants to balance our upside down tax code. Um, the poorest Washingtonians pay the highest percentage of their income in taxes um, versus the wealthy pay the lowest. Mm -hmm. um, the working families tax credit, something that had been passed but not funded. Um, and the way it was rolled out, it was said to have reduced child poverty in Washington by half. Um, so I, I would love to share at some point when the, the reports and the data comes out to show you exactly what that looks like, but um, a huge boost to working families at a time when they were suffering the most from COVID economic strain. I would also say the expansion of voting rights to those who have been formerly incarcerated. Mm -hmm. uh, that, was, that was very big. Um, the police accountability bills that Elise had uh, mentioned also so I, I would think those are those are the top and I, the ones that was disappointment and I think it's been a disappointment for a while now is dental therapy for oh. providing dental uh, care and access to children uh, that has not been able to get a vote or get out of a committee and that has been a disappointment and so we do need some help on that this year to to reach that uh, to reach that goal. Uh, good dental hygiene impacts so much of our physical well-being uh, over and above just uh, dental issues. We've talked about that need to engage with legislators, their staffs, people in Olympia. Uh, how important also is it for people to speak of what uh, concerns them, what troubles them, what their goals are with their neighbors, other important people in their lives to get a sense that uh, there are people out there that care about this and that you're also maybe influencing other people to in turn contact their legislators. Is it important for them to also talk that up? I would say absolutely, yes. Um, there are people in our network who are such troopers. They come to every event. They come to every advocacy day. And whenever they speak up in a group and say, it's not scary, I was scared the first time I went but don't be put off by the big buildings. Don't, your legislators are citizens like you, speak mm -hmm. to them. So I take great um, comfort and uh, inspiration from some of the, you know, longtime advocates in our network who just, they, they didn't wait for wins to continue to advocate. They just mm -hmm. know that it's the right thing to do and their faith calls them to do it. Um, so yes, talk to each other about it. Yes, it's definitely important uh, for people to speak to their neighbors, to their friends, to create the civic culture so that these legislative wins can happen. Uh, but also, who do people listen to? Uh, politicians or their friends and neighbors? They listen to the advice of those that are near them and that they trust. Good point. Terry? 
You know, the Abrahamic tradition isn't just, you know, saying love your neighbor as you love yourself uh, as some kind of theological notion we should repeat. It, it really is a wisdom about how to build a thriving, peaceful community that can be sustained over time, right? But how do you love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor and talk to them? Mm -hmm. And so when people of faith, when people who are part of wisdom communities come together, hear each other out, understand uh, each other's perspective, we're really strengthened. And then we can begin to uh, express love of neighbor and love of self, not only emotionally, not only relationally, but also in terms of policy, which is where so much of our life as a people is shaped. And that's why we're, we're so always so excited about the Faith Action Network. And Jeff, also thankful for your work in sharing the positive stories um, out there, because right now we know we're only hearing the negative about mm -hmm. our neighbors. And so thank you for the work you do uh, on this program, too. Well, thanks all around. And Elise and Kristen and Terry, I thank you very much for your time and perspectives. And we'll want to come back after the legislative session and see how we've done and perhaps get some more guidelines for people to become involved because it does seem that there is too much apathy and that that has grown over the last couple of years. So thank you very much for the work you do. And thank you to all of you out there for watching and or listening to this program and hope you'll join us next week for the next edition of Challenge 2.0. Thank you very much. If you've enjoyed this program, found our conversations to be informative, entertaining and thought provoking. And the vision inspiring of people from different backgrounds who can disagree without being disagreeable, perhaps you might consider supporting our program with a contribution. Your support will not only help our program continue, it will also support the broader efforts of Paths to Understanding, our supporting parent nonprofit organization.